So we're going through our season of in our wrestling, looking at different ways and how different people have wrestled with the things of God um, through the word of God. So I'll pray. And today we're going to be looking at Joshua, Joshua 5, 1 to 15. Jesus, I want to thank you again for who you are. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your inspired word. We thank you for the foundation of our faith. And I pray, Lord, as we go through your words, would you speak to us? Would you give us ears to hear and hearts to perceive? Speak to us, Lord. Let deep speak to deep. That we would truly know what it is to walk with you and wrestle with you so that we get your understanding in our lives, Lord as we surrender to your ways. Bless us with your word. Amen. So Joshua 5, 1 to 15. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted, uh, melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Wow, what a start. I suggest in your own time, read Joshua, see where we've come to. The way God did this miracle was weird. It wasn't like the Red Sea where he parted it and they walked across on dry land. He caused water to pile up upon itself. How does that happen? How God can do anything. He spoke creation into being. He's the one who calms the storms. He's the one, if he says water, no more, and it keeps coming, it will just pile up on itself. They crossed on dry land. That reputation spread everywhere. And suddenly, the Amorite kings and the Canaanite kings no longer had courage to face the Israelites. Can you imagine that? You know, put yourself in their place. The people of God, the gods that they've got with them, how can we fight against that? Carrying on. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeoth Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the wilderness on the way, leaving Egypt as they left Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the lands that he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us. A land flowing with milk and honey so he raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they'd not been circumcised on the way. I think he's making a point of that. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after. They ate this fruit from the land. There was no longer any, man any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Sorry, with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. Well, I find that amazing neither he replied but as commander of the army of the lord i have now come 
Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. There's a lot in there. So much in that verse. So in our wrestling, now Joshua had taken on the mantle of Moses. Moses was now dead. Joshua takes on the mantle. He's leading the people of God into the promises of God. He's carrying the promises of God. His commission is to enter the promised land. The land that was promised, but is taken by battles. God's promises are given with a promise, but always taken by battles. God says, it's yours, now go and fight for it. It's yours, now go and fight for it. Wrestle for it. In Joshua 1.5, God says to him, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the promise for every Christian. I am with you always. Therefore, be strong and courageous. He is with you. Be strong and courageous. He is with you. Be strong and courageous. Because we drift, don't we? All the time. From the moment we're in his presence to the moment we go out, drift starts. Stop drifting. Be strong and courageous and stand for him. What God says to him in verse 6 of chapter 1, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Now Joshua leads the people, not Moses. Moses is dead. Actually, all those that have gone before us, John, James, Luke, Paul, all the heroes that we read in scripture, they've all gone. It's over to us. Did you know that? It's over to you. It's over to me to carry forth the kingdom of God as he works in you and through you. We've all got a commission. We all carry the great commission. It's been given to us. Be strong and courageous. Now, Joshua leads the people into the promise. God, read some of the heroes of the Bible. Smith Wigglesworth, have you heard of him? If not, go and buy a book and read it. You'll be amazed. Amy Temple McPherson. When she preached for 20 miles around, people fell on their hands and knees under conviction of sin in their homes, in the factories, wherever they were. When she preached in one particular place, the police were outside trying to manage crowd control. Then the building shook with the presence of God. The police looked grey as they were about to die. And people got saved everywhere. Be strong and courageous. Be bold and courageous. This God who parted the sea and the kings trembled and didn't want to face God's people. They'd already given up because of God. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Are we? Can you say the church today is the same as the church in the New Testament or what's gone on? It should be the same. God parts the Jordan as he did the Red Sea. This time the water piles on itself and all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites, the Lord. And their hearts melted in fear and they had no courage to face the Israelites. But Joshua doesn't just rush in. The king's hearts have melted. Joshua doesn't just, come on, let's take them. He does something here. He doesn't just rush in. He knows not to be presumptuous. He's a man after God. He knows better than just to assume, oh, God is with us, we can do what we want. No. No, he does something quite significant. Do you remember it was laboured 
at the beginning. He stops. He stops. There's the report that all the kings have melted in fear. So Joshua stops. Verse 7. God raised up sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they'd not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. He came to the crossroads and he stopped. Let's make sure we are walking in the covenant promises by making sure that we are being obedient to the covenant. He had with him an army of uncircumcised men. They were not acting within the covenant requirements to allow God's blessing. So he stops. Let's go back. Jeremiah 6.16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And then you will find rest for your souls. Let's not have the same response of what the people did there. But you said we will not walk in it. No. God says walk in the ancient paths. Do not deviate to the right or to the left from everything that's written in the book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is God's way. Walk in it. Walk in it. Joshua took them back and circumcised them all. Mil military speaking, that was not wise. They had to be still for days until they healed. If the other armies had come and engaged them in battle then and there, Israel, Israel would have been defeated. But God is sovereign. Come on, army, I'm just going to maim you before you go. <laughs> Stay in God's promises, no matter how vulnerable it may make you feel. His way is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to the Father except through Jesus. There's only one gospel to salvation, and it's through him, and him alone, and doing it his way, the covenant ways. And don't we wrestle with them? It is a wrestling. I know I've said it before, when I first read this book, there were things I didn't understand. It went contrary to everything I'd ever been taught in school from the age of then. And suddenly it was like, what? Adam and Eve? Really? How does that work? And then as I'm reading it, a flood? How does that work? And then I remember reading about a man being swallowed by a fish. I thought, really? And then I got to the New Testament. See, I know people say read the New Testament first, but I hadn't read a book. This was the first book I ever read in my 20s. I was not academic in any way, shape or form. And I picked it up and I read it. When I got to the New Testament, I'd already met with Jesus. And I know his ways are beyond my ways. I know what he says is truth. And he commends Adam and Eve. He commends the flood. And he commends Jonah. He quotes all three as fact. And I went, Jesus, if you say it's true, I know it's true then. And I'm going to wrestle. And now I've got no problem with it at all. I believe he spoke creation into being. I believe this world was flooded. Absolutely. Why? Because God had enough with sin and had to judge it. And then raised up Noah and his family. Jonah, yeah, I believe. He was a prophet who frustrates the life out of me. God tells him to go and see revival and he goes the other way. Why? Because he didn't want the pagans saved. But God's way was done through him. If God can use Jonah, he can use you. Honestly, God spoke through a donkey. Have you not read that? He can speak through me. <laughs> 
John 14, verse 16. Jesus' way is the only way. Walk in it. Walk in his way. John 14, 6. Follow his commands. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. His words are true. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my commands. I hear so many people saying, I love Jesus, but. But. <laughs> well, you may know about him, but you don't love him. How deep is your love for him? Is he a tag on? I put him somewhere. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I wear the Christian coat. He wants your heart. He wants you. And he wants you to surrender to his ways. For in his ways is life and life in abundance. If, if he is the pearl of great price, everything else is secondary. And then you will find life and life in abundance. And then you will find the fullness of joy as you put him first. First, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, and then the other stuff. If you put the other stuff first, you try and find peace and fulfillment through that, and you never will, ever, because then they become idols. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Oh. He's our great reward. Going right back to Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. So leave all that you know and familiar with and go to a place that I will show you. Where am I going? Just go that way. Show you when you get there. But more than that, I will be. Your shield and your very great reward. The one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will love them and show myself to do you want him? Are you after him? Well, put him first. All who seek, find. Put him first. He'll never be a second. He's Lord. He's God. The other week when we was at that conference, I loved it when Steve Apple said, God is not your butler. Yeah, well, people think he is. Lord, get me this, get me that, do this, do that, blah, 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 and then I'll serve you. What? <laughs> He's king, he's lord. If King Charles walked in, I bet your behaviour would be odd. Yeah, because we'd all be, oh, what do I do? What do I? If Jesus walked in, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the one who is holy, the one who has no sin, the one who is perfect in every way, who one day we're going to see eye to eye. Get ready. Get ready. I promise all of you, you're going to see him face to face. Where do you think, who do you think you see when your last day's gone? And his banner over you is love. But how embarrassed will you be? Get ready. John 15, 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. <laughs> There's something to wrestle with. I hope that makes you think. I hope you've got other Bible verses bouncing around now in your wrestling. If you remain in my love, I will remain in your love. Sorry. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Do you want to remain in his love? What, can we lose God's love? Wrestle over it. Wrestle over it. Dig deep. Don't just assume. Joshua, before he moved on, said, hang on, what's wrong here? Are we in the covenant? Oh, what haven't we done? Let's go back. Let's go back. What are we supposed to do? Circumcision. That's the covenant. Do you remember when Moses, Moses, called of God, was just about to go somewhere and there was an angel waiting to kill him 
God had sent death to Moses because he was uncircumcised. Moses himself had to go back and be circumcised. God's word is unchanging. He will not mold it to your views. He tells you to wrestle and surrender and make him Lord of your life. You're not his Lord. He's our Lord. And he's not your butler. Wrestle. After stopping and making sure the whole community comes back into the covenant, this is in verse 11, the day after Passover, so they've gone back. Are we in the covenant promise? Are we walking the way God's intended us to walk? God's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. Read Jude. In Jude, the brother of Jesus, he says, this same Jesus. Some tra translations will say, this same Lord. And then it gives you the explanation that it's Jesus. But the original text said, this same Jesus, the one who led you out of Egypt and then later destroyed those who did not believe. The same Jesus. The Jesus that we know is the word that became flesh, but is seen in the Old Testament so many times. Who was in the flames with Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego? The one who looked like the son of man. It was the son of man. The word became flesh. He is God. And he's unchanging. If you can understand that, you'll realise how big grace is. Come on, the likes of me are going to heaven. The likes of you are going to heaven. And his holiness has not changed. His grace has met you in the depth of your depravity and made you holy. God, price he paid. The price he paid. No wonder he's the way, the truth and the life. There is no other way. I need a saviour and so do you. But did you notice? So they've stopped. They've gone back to those ancient ways. And then we find in verse 11, the day after that Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. They'd survived for 40 years on manna, on God giving them, translates as stuff. <laughs> God giving them this stuff. What is it? They went out and got this manna, never been seen before, and you can't get it now. It was miraculous provision for 40 years. What is it? It's stuff. What does it taste like? Stuff. <laughs> it must have been nice, I hope, because God is gracious. Suddenly, there's no more manna. Suddenly. Suddenly, everything's different. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce of Canaan. They've now walked into a new season, completely new season. They've gone back to the ancient ways. They've got their foundations. They're moving on. Change. Reset. As a church, we stopped. Do you remember? Everything stops, just prayer meetings. We're going to make sure we're walking with God. That was back in November. Now we're still in. Reset. We're still in this, well, where's God taking us? Who are we going to be? Now, I had a strange picture while I was going over my notes this morning. I was going to bring it at the end, but I'll bring it now. Anyone ever been in a relay race? When someone, you've got a team of people racing each other, and they're all at different stages, and you've all got this baton, a stick, and you're running, and your aim is to get to the next person as fast as possible to give them that baton that they take and run and do the same. What so often happens with church is we start with our baton, and when we get to them, we go, oh, this is the way you do it. Now, if you can run and you get shoes like me, hold on to this baton, we go together. And then you go to the next person, and they're on it, and then you've got, and before you know it, you've got four people all holding this baton, all saying, right, what way are we going? <laughs> no. Run your race. Have people ready with the foundations. You're going that way with him and pass the baton on. Don't hold on to it. Pass it on. And let them run. This was going on. No more manner. Well, what do we do? 
This generation had grown up only knowing manna. 40 years in the desert. <laughs> Everyday manna. Well, what do we do now then? Well, look around you. There's food all over the place. Go and get it. And that's what they did. It was different. Well, I'm going to sit here until I get manna. Well, you're going to be hungry then. <laughs> it didn't come again. It was different. They walked into the season of reset, a different season. No more were they, could they be what they were. They weren't wanderers anymore. They weren't manor eaters anymore. They were to go and possess the land. Change. What worked yesterday would not work. Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. They kept the covenant foundations. Now it was different. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I believe this is a prophetic word over the church. Not just Vec, but over the church. God is doing a new thing. Don't worry about what you see. You see, judgment always starts in the house of God. Always does. What we're seeing at the moment, it's just like John the Baptist said about Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will separate the wheat from the chaff. So the church in the West is having a bash. Bang. The chaff's going to blow away. But what is of God? What is of the word? What is of truth will remain? It's a sifting. Let's stay with the word. Let's stay with him. It's a new thing. He's preparing a move of his glory. Isn't that exciting? I think it is. The, the spiritual atmosphere has changed. I don't know if you've noticed. Oh, I'm on different drugs now. <laughs> Sorry. That is a joke. <laughs> Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past, the good old days. Actually, they weren't that good. In reality, they were not that good. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness. Oh, it's barren out there. Streams in the wasteland. We're moving on. We're going on. We're starting to sail with him to where he wants us to go. Our foundation is the word of God. And it's not going to deviate. We're going to carry on. The inspired word of God. The promises of God. And the promises of God are word and spirit. The author of this book, the Holy Spirit who inspired every word, is the one who lives in our hearts and will lead us into truth, not away from it. He will take us in to the word. Our foundation is Christ and always will be. So God is for you. But he may not be for what you're doing. Let's look at verse 13. And this is within recalibration. We're, we're, as a church, we went through stop, reset, and we're still in this recalibration before we start running in the things of God. And we're still there. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. Neither. I think that's a good pause, isn't it? But God, you're for us. You're for us. He's for you because he loves you. That does not mean he's for the decisions you make. Well, God's for me, I can do this, he'll bless it. No, it's not that at all. Are you for them or are you, are you for us? Who are you for? 
But as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. He's for God. He's for the Lord's ways. We have to acknowledge that Jesus said, I will build my church, his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that. His church will be built and it will be glorious. And before he comes back, the church, they will say, the bride has made herself ready. The church is going to be awesome as he builds it his way. What do we do? We do what Joshua did. Then Joshua fell face down in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Your will be done. Oh Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. What do we do? Your will be done. We surrender to the king, we don't make him our butler. It's his way. It's his way. We surrender. We wrestle and he will beat us and we surrender. But within that surrendering is, remember your promises, Lord. I will not let you go until you bless me. Remember your promises, this covenant relationship we have. That's what we're pressing in to get. The promises, given with a promise, taken with battles, taken with prayer, fasting, seeking after him, making him your Lord, desiring the things of God, seeking first the kingdom of God, seeking. What does it mean to go and seek, to move in it? to go after, to hunger after, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts of prophecy. Eagerly desire, go after them. Not just, I'm seeking after God. Don't be passive. Don't be passive. Get into the word and make it yours. Joshua 7, 13. You see, the church is going to be very, very successful. The church of Jesus Christ will be exactly what he's called it to be. Does that mean we are going to be? Only if we do it his way. Only if we do it his way. Will you have peace in your life? Only if. You put him first. What, is that conditional? No, it's the way you get the promise. I can give you a glass to go and get water, but you have to go and fill it up. Well, that's conditional. I'm not your butler. (laughs) And he's not our butler. He tells us the way, and he says, you will be blessed if you walk in it. And it starts in prayer. And it starts praying God's promises for you and God's promises over others. My prayer over my household is, Lord, you said you and your household will be saved. So for those who are not walking with him at the moment, they're at the top of my prayer list. And I'm praying according to God's promise. Did you know in Isaiah, he even says, I will carry your children from afar. So it may look like they're far away from God, but he'll come and carry them. Why? Because it's in his promise. And I will not let you go until you bless me. Do you get it? As it is in your word, that's what I will settle for. Press in, fight, grab, don't be passive. Joshua 7.13. I'm landing. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow for this is what the lord the god of israel says there's other things among you there are devoted things among you they taken into themselves other idols they had other things that they put on the same level as god And what God says is you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Seek first the kingdom of God and 
his righteousness. The kingdom of God is like a man who dealt in pearls, and he found a pearl. And when he saw it, he sold everything that he had that he might have that pearl. That's what God thinks of us. You're his, you are his pearl of great price. He left heaven for you. Is he your pearl of great price? Or is our response, cheers, mate, that's nice. Oh, it's Lord, my God. In Jeremiah 6.16, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it. It's exactly what Joshua did. He was told by the commander of the Lord's army, take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That's what he did. No wonder at the end of his life, Joshua boasted in Joshua 23 verse 14. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God gave us as found. All the promises have happened to Joshua, with Joshua. Why? Because he put himself positionally right, surrendered to God in every way. Not one has failed. But then in verse 15, he does warn them. He warns the people. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised has come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this land. And it happens. When you read through Kings, when you read through Samuel, when you read through the Bible, you'll see the Lord's people putting him first and then you see them taking on the values of the world around them. And as they do that, God drives them out and then calls them back. He raises people up to take them back Consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves. Be who you are, people of God. Live as you are, people of God. Let's keep walking in the truth. And you can't do it alone. Alwyn's message last week, that was profound. You need friends. You need other people of faith around you. He was talking about the, the crippled beggar who they lowered through the roof. He couldn't have done it on his own. He needed friends to get him there and to put him before Jesus. Get a group of Christians around you. Start being proactive in your faith and in your faith community. Don't be a lone ranger because you won't make it. I'm not saying you're going to lose salvation, but you'll be miserable. We've got community because God wants us in community. And that's why we're looking at other churches to relate with as well. We're walking more with other churches than what we ever have. And that's just the beginning. We're going to be jumping in with them, doing various things. Remember in April, we're going to be going with Hope Church to Tunbridge School and doing a weekend with them. They're going to provide everything. We're just going to turn up. It's nice, isn't it? Then Pete Gregg. We're going to the wildfires. We're going to spend a weekend together with I don't know how many other churches, enjoying company of other Christians. We're not in this alone, and we're not supposed to be. We're in the family of God. So I'll land there, and then we'll respond in communion. We could have a song to, or worship song, to focus on the Lord. So Father, I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you for this covenant relationship that we're in with you. And as we prepare our hearts to look at what that is, Lord, will you open our eyes? Holy Spirit, walk am among us and let us know the truth because it's the truth that sets us free. And through you, Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, bring your truths in Jesus' name. Amen.